All right, let me invite you to grab a Bible. And uh, we made it to Judges 13. Judges 13. I, uh, I had planned to take the entire chapter for 25 verses, and I couldn't get past five. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, okay? Judges 13, 1 through 5. Lord willing, we'll take the rest of the chapter next week. But maybe we'll just do another five. I don't know. Uh, so that's where we're at. Judges 13, verses 1 through 5. As you turn in God's word together, let's pause and ask for the Lord to help us in this time. Let's pray. Father, we, we open our Bibles first in prayer acknowledging our need for your help, our dependence upon your Holy Spirit's illumination, our dependence upon your Holy Spirit's conviction, Lord. And we're grateful for the Bible, which is your very breath, your very word, which is recorded without error, which is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It is the sword of your Holy Spirit. And we do pray, Father, for the sake of your name, for the glory of Jesus Christ, that Your Spirit would just do a work on us, Lord. If that means making us feel terrible, if that means opening our eyes to important truth, if that means comforting our weary souls, Lord, whatever is necessary, we pray You would do for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our reading from the book of Judges, verses 1-5. through And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, And eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. For those who have ears to hear, may God grant us understanding from his word. So you've heard me talk about how beneficial it is to study books of the Bible. At a, at a time, like, as we are in a custom of doing. Uh, and I like studying books of the Bible because that's how God has given us the Bible. They're in books, right? So I think it's helpful to kind of take them that way. And so I think that's especially proven true of the book of Judges because, I don't know, the author's taken us on a ride in this book, hasn't he? A- and it's a wild ride. It's, it's a, a ride that you're likely to get carsick from. Uh, but he's, he, we're on a ride in the book of Judges. And now... We have come to the last judge of the book, the final judge, and it's all leading to this guy. And who is it? It's Samson. It's Samson. Uh, This is the literary peak of the book of Judges. Now, the the story of Samson does not end the book of Judges. There is a horrifically ugly postscript that we are going to study that Quite frankly, I'm not looking forward to. Um, But that comes after the Samson story. The Samson story is kind of where this is all crescendoing at, the story of Judges. He's the last judge, and he gets the most space of all the judges devoted to him. And and if you could just try to imagine that you don't know anything about Samson. Can you do that? Just like a mind wipe, all right? You don't know anything about Samson. If you didn't know how his story ended, I wonder how you would be looking at this final judge. Right? And I think if we didn't know it, how the story ended, if we didn't know anything about Samson and how Judges ends, we would be tempted to be full of optimism about this one. Right? Because here for the first time, we're being ta- told about a judge who is being sanctified from the womb to be the Savior of Israel. Isn't that what's being described here? set apart, consecrated, sanctified from his mother's womb in a miraculous birth, by the way, to be Israel's Savior. Does that sound familiar? See, we've been seeing failure after failure in the book of Judges. We have rebellion after rebellion, idolatry after idolatry. And now the author goes out of his way to describe a different kind of deliverer, 
this one's different, right? Or at least that's what we're thinking. A deliverer who had a divine birth announcement. Gideon didn't have that. Jephthah didn't have that. A deliverer who would have a supernatural birth. A deliverer who's consecrated from the womb. So if, if you didn't know any better, you would be thinking, I think this is Messiah, right? If you were part of Israel at that time, you're thinking, this is the man. This is, this is the offspring of the woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent, right? Th- this is the one. This is the judge to end all judges. This is the Savior to end all saviors. And yet, <laughs> we know how Samson's story ends, don't we? He turns out to be, I don't want to give this away to you. If you're like biting your nails, like, how's this going to turn out? If you don't know, here's a spoiler. He's an incredibly powerfully gifted man who's pretty much terrible. He is, right? He's terrible. And he cares more about fulfilling his own lusts and his own desires than obeying and giving God glory, right? But there's a lot for us to learn here in the opening verses of this Samson narrative. I wanted, like I said, I wanted to take the whole chapter, but there's enough in the first five verses to keep us busy for today. So that's what we're going to look at. And in these first five verses, we see this. Man is ignorant of his greatest need and relies fully on God's grace to receive it. Man is ignorant of his greatest need and relies fully on God's grace to receive it. We're going to study three aspects of Samson's arrival as Savior. Three aspects of Samson's arrival as Savior. The first aspect of his arrival as Savior is the need of salvation we see. We see the need of salvation. So you guys are all old pros now, judges, right? We just had a judge die in the last verse. So we know what comes next. What comes next? Israel again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Are you used to that yet? Okay, that's what's coming. Verse 1, And the people of Israel again did was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. We knew that was coming, right? This is what we expect Israel to do, but let's pause for a second and look at what the author is saying because we really need to think about the author's words here. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We've seen that often, but often we've just moved on, right? Here I want to think about it. The one who determined the, f- the fact that their actions was evil was who? And whose eyes determines whether someone's actions are evil or righteous? It is the Lord, right? It is the Lord. He is the one who provides the standard for what is evil, and He is the one who provides the standard for what is righteous, And we've seen that phrase often in Judges, but this actually is the last time it occurs in the book. This is the last time we see it. We won't see this phrase again. Instead, we'll see another related phrase. At the end of the book, it appears twice, and it's this. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Kind of the same thing, right? Everybody did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. As it turns out, what is right in our own eyes is very often different than what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Did you know that? It's often different. And so this, this is a problem that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden itself with Adam and Eve. They wanted to determine what's right and what's wrong for themselves. They don't want God telling them what's right and wrong. We are going to determine what's right and wrong for themselves. And that's what Israel is doing. The same language is used in the next chapter when Samson tells his parents that he wanted to marry a Philistine woman, which was forbidden in in Israel. And why did Samson, what what justification does Samson give for wanting to marry a Philistine woman? Do you know? In chapter 14, verse 3, this is what he tells his father. Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. She is right in my eyes. And, And so this points out the people of Israel were not doing what's right in God's eyes. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. And what's the point? They believed their actions were right. They believed their actions were right. They believed they had a justification for doing what they were doing, living how they were living. You know, they weren't thinking, well, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know what I'm, I'm doing is wrong. They're thinking, no, 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 God is wrong. I'm right if they're even thinking of God at all. They might not even be. They're just doing, I, 
This is what's right, what I'm doing, what I'm determining. Tim Keller draws an important point here. He writes, this teaches us that sin does not ultimately consist of violating our conscience or violating community standards, but rather consists of violating God's will for us. That's what sin is. Sin is not you violate what your conscience says is right. Sin is not you violate what our culture or community tells us is right. Sin ultimately has the, is defined by God. And when we sin, it's when we violate what He says is right or wrong. We all have consciences. But you, did you know that our consciences are not actually lined up with God's Word all the time? Did, did you know that? Sometimes they're not, right? Sometimes they're not. And so we live in a community and a culture that has adopted a set of morals. It has adopted a set of standards of right and wrong. Israel was living in a culture of morals and rights and wrongs amongst the Canaanites, right? We can't have an adjustable standard of right and wrong. You know, this is right for me, but it's not, might maybe not be right for you, right? But that's often what we try to do. And so we cannot let our sense of righteousness and, and wickedness define what is or isn't acceptable because we're all sinners. Our hearts are deceptive, right? They're, they're wicked. And so, again, Keller is really helpful here. He says, I'm going to quote him at length because it's really important what he says. He says, once again, we admit that our own eyes are not sufficient for defining sin. Then whose eyes are? Is evil defined by what is so in experts' eyes? Or in the majority's eyes. These views don't avoid holocausts either. No, the Bible's answer is the right one. Sin is defined as violating our relationship with God, as violating the will of God for us. What God sees as sin is sin, regardless of we f- what we feel or the experts say or the culture agrees on. Feels like a very modern problem, doesn't it? Who defines what's right and what's wrong? It's a modern problem, but guess what? It goes all the way back to the garden. That's why Adam and Eve rebelled against God, right? Who has the wisdom, the power, and authority to determine what's right and what's wrong? And we must confess as Christians that only God has the authority to do that. Only God has the authority to declare righteousness, what's right and what's sinful. And so Christians, we face a lot of kickback today because we uphold God's Word in some areas because God's Word in some areas is not popular today, right? And yet, who has the power and the authority to determine what is good and what's evil? Is it sinful man or is it a righteous and holy God? And we have to have some humility in saying, you know what, I'm a sinner. There's not a day in my life where I haven't sinned. Maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe God is right. And it takes humility to do that. And yet that's the truth. Were you always going to agree with God on right and wrong? Now be honest. No, sometimes we won't. We're going to kick against what he defines as sin. I don't agree with that. Right? And understand that anytime we don't agree with God about what's right and what's wrong, there's one person that's wrong in that situation, and it's not God. We, and our sense of righteousness, our sense of justice is warped. It's warped. It's tainted by the flesh. We are influenced by the world. And the world, I mean, I always like the joke, you know, it was true. Pirates had their own moral code. They had their own sense of righteousness, right? These guys are known for stealing and and murdering, and yet they had their own pirate code. But there there is, humanly speaking, we have this sense of of conscience and righteousness, but it has to be ultimately defined by God and His Word. Only he has the power and the authority to define what is righteous and what is sinful. And we, as believers, are called to submit to his standards and not vice versa. Whether it's popular or not. We, God 
giving them into the hand of their enemy, the Philistines, for 40 years. Okay, that follows the normal path. We're used to that, too. Okay, what should come next? The people should cry out. They should cry out for help, right? They should cry out. That's what we would expect. Now, not necessarily in repentance. There's only one time so far in Judges we've seen them actually give some form of repentance. And that was before Jephthah, right? But they're crying out, just help us. We need relief from the oppression. We need help. We need relief. And yet, do you see them crying out for help in verse 1? No, it's not there, right? We look ahead to verse 2. Are they crying out for help in verse 2? No, God is already at work raising up a Savior in verse 2. So here, and it's conspicuous by its absence, the people aren't crying out for help. And how long are they they're under the oppression of the Philistines? 40 years! 40 years. That's a long time, right? So did the author just forget? The, you know, I could just imagine I'm writing this saying, I'm so sick of writing about these fools. I mean, they just keep messing up. I'm just going to skip over this part. You think he just forgot to add that they cried for help? No! No, he didn't. This is intentional. This is speaking about the condition of the people of Israel. It seems that they have become so accustomed to living as slaves in their servitude that they have become content in their bondage. That's a scary place to be. They, they don't even seem like they want to be delivered at this point, right? This speaks volumes about their spiritual condition. Israel had become a people who'd become numb to their condition that they're now not even asking for help. They're numb to it. And so what happens? Well, here, here's where God's grace intervenes in a spectacular way. The people are not crying out for help, and yet what is God doing? He's going to help them, right? He's going to help them. God's grace is at work to deliver a people who can't even recognize the depth of their need. Does that sound amazing to you? God's grace is at work to deliver a people who can't even recognize the depth of their need. Does that sound familiar to you? I hope you see the connection of that with our faith as Christians. God has extended the same grace to us. You know why? Because we're all slaves. What, what does Jesus say in John? Anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. A slave to sin. And we're born into this world as slaves to sin. And we're so accustomed to being slaves to sin that we have no idea just how desperate our condition is. We have no idea of the depth of our depravity. We have no idea of the depth of our problem. We're like the Israelites here who are in servitude to the Philistines and they're so numb to their condition that they don't even cry out to help for God. And Paul points out this, this condition in us. In Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 9 and following, he says, what then are the Jews off? No, no. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's all of us before Christ. That's every human world born into sin. We are numb to it. We are slaves to sin. We don't seek for God. We don't want God. Now you might be thinking, well, that's true, Pastor, but one day I woke up and I got smart enough. And, 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 I, and I got smart enough to say, oh, look how terrible this condition is. Jesus is my hope and my answer. I'm going to cry out to Jesus for help. But in reality, do you know that that's not even true? The reality is, and what the Scriptures teach, is that the only way we have a sense of the depth of our need is because of the Holy Spirit making you aware of it. Only because of the work of the Holy Spirit convicting us through God's Word, showing us that you are in desperate state of sinfulness and condemnation, and your only hope is Jesus Christ. 
The Spirit opens our blind eyes to that truth. It is God's grace, His unmerited favor, which pricks our hearts and reveals our great need. And praise the Lord that He rises to help us before we get smart enough to ask for it. Because you will never, left to your own devices, left to ourselves in the flesh, we will never get smart enough to ask for help. Because we are the hardest, what what does Jeremiah say? The heart is wicked, right? And desperately sick. And so God loves us before we ever knew him. And he sent his son to die for us. So that his grace extended to a people who were so lost they didn't even know they needed help. And that's all of us. That's all of us. And that's what's happening here with Israel. So the first aspect of Samson's arrival as Savior is the need of salvation. A second aspect we see is a supernatural salvation. A supernatural salvation. How is it a supernatural salvation? Look at verse 2. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. So we're told about this certain man of Zorah. Now Zorah was a small town on the border between Judah and Dan and their territory. The man was from the tribe of Dan. His name is Manoah, and we're told that his wife was barren and she had no children. And so Manoah's wife was going to have a very important meeting. So look at verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. So here's the angel of the Lord again. Who was he? You remember the angel of the Lord? We've seen him with Gideon. He appeared to Gideon. He appears all throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes he speaks for God. Sometimes he speaks as God. Right? And many believe, I think rightfully, that this is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, before he was born into this world. And so if you jump down further in this chapter to verse 21, we see the angel of the Lord clearly was a manifestation of God himself because Samson's parents, when they realized who it was, they had the same reaction Gideon did. Oh no, we're going to die because we just talked to God, right? So they had that same realization. We'll look at that next week. But this is a manifestation of God himself. So the angel of the Lord appears to the woman and says, you're barren, you don't have any kids, but you're going to conceive and bear a son. Now, this is significant because anyone, if you have a cursory knowledge of the Bible, right, you know that this is a big deal, right? Samson is a miracle baby. He, he's born to a woman who couldn't have babies. She was barren. Uh, that alone is momentous, but biblical history records numerous miraculous births, right? And they almost always signify God is about to do something extraordinary through that child, right? And so we see this with Sarah. We see it with Rebecca. We saw it with Rachel. We saw it later on, actually, in 1 Samuel with Hannah, right? And uh, then later in the New Testament, we saw it with Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist. And then we see another mother named Mary, is significant and so this is god at work in a major way and and so we're being told not just that samson's birth was unlikely like this was really kind of out of left field like this shouldn't have happened it's not just that his birth was unlikely we're being told his birth was impossible impossible apart from the working the supernatural working of god and this is the pattern that god likes to repeat he loves working through supernatural births right He he loves to work through supernatural births. Of course, this is meant to make us look forward to the birth and coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because as miraculous as Samson's birth is, and and a barren woman giving birth is pretty miraculous, right? Jesus' birth takes it up a few notches, doesn't it? Because Jesus was not born to a barren woman. He was born to a virgin, okay? So when it comes to Samson's mother, when it comes to Uh, Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Elizabeth and Hannah, they all conceived through the natural means of conceiving. It was just God was opening up the womb. It was a miracle. But in Jesus' case, that didn't happen. God enabled Mary to conceive without a human father at all. And so what's the point of this? 
well, God is showing us something very important about salvation, something that we all need to understand. And that is that salvation is not something that human beings can accomplish on their own. Salvation is always a, a miraculous work of God. A- always. He's showing us that t- salvation, all salvation, is always due to His supernatural power. A- and we know that God is still bringing about supernatural, miraculous births today. Isn't He? What, what did Jesus say in John chapter 3? Anyone who wants to see the kingdom of God must be born again. Are you talking about regular birth? Nicodemus even asked him that. Are you talking about another natural birth for my mother? Right? What did Jesus say? It's like, are you still so dense you don't get this? What did Jesus say? No, no, no. You need to be born again. Born of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Spirit. And what the reality is, anytime somebody trusts in Jesus by faith, they are regenerated. They are born again. They're giving a supernatural, miraculous birth. That's a miraculous birth that Jesus says you must have to receive salvation. If you're a Christian today, it's because God worked a miracle in your heart and caused you to be born again. Peter says that as much in the beginning of his letter, that God caused us to be born again. It's a miracle that we often take for granted. And God shows Israel and the whole world that if if we are ever going to find salvation, we don't just need a little nudge in the right direction. You need a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate your heart and open your eyes to the truth about who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus has done to save you. We all need a divine miracle. We all need a divine miracle. Because we're all dead in our sins and trespasses and our only hope was a resurrection from the dead. Our only hope is a new birth. And so this takes us to the third aspect of Samson's arrival as Savior, and that is he's going to bring an incomplete salvation. An incomplete salvation. It becomes clear that this miracle baby born to the barren woman is going to be set apart from the womb. Look at verses 4 and 5. The angel of the Lord is talking to his mother and says, Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So here, God gives some important prenatal care instructions, right? To Samson's mother. She was not to drink any wine during her pre- pregnancy. Good, good care. I asked my wife and midwife. Yeah, uh, good care for, for all expected mothers. But this is a little bit different, we see. She's not to drink any wine or alcohol or eat anything unclean while she was pregnant. Uh, and then after she gives birth, she's not to give her son any haircuts. So Samson, you know, you're never going to go to the barber for that first time. Never going to get the little clip of hair for the baby book. You know, she, he's not going to get any of that. He's not to get any haircuts. Why? Well, because he was called to be a Nazarite from the womb. And you think, well, what is a Nazarite? Okay. Um, the instructions for Nazarites, or the Nazarite vow, are found in Numbers chapter 6. The word Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Nazir, meaning one separated or consecrated. Any Israelite male or female could take on a Nazarite vow for a period of time. Okay, And it was a vow to separate yourself to God. And it was always voluntary. You didn't have to take on the vow. It was a voluntary vow. And it, carried, and it was only always for a select period of time. And there's three main prohibitions with the Nazarite vow. During your vow, you were not to drink any wine, any alcohol, or partake of anything made from grapes. That was one prohibition. A second prohibition is you were not to cut your hair during the, the length of the vow. And the third prohibition is you were not to go near a dead body, even if it were a parent or a sibling, during the course of your vow. So, so those are the ground rules for the Nazarite vow. But what God prescribes to Samson has some really important distinctions from the normal Nazarite vow. How is that different? First of all, was Samson's vow voluntary? This kid is getting this vow placed on him by God in the womb, right? In the womb. It's not voluntary. God says this is what he must do. Spoken to his mother. It was not voluntary at all. Um, Secondly, 
Samson was given a permanent vow, a permanent vow. So the Nazarite vow was always for a select period of time. Samson's was womb to tomb. He's, he's supposed to be a Nazarite from all, his, all of his life, even starting in his mother's womb. And, and not to give away the story or be a spoiler or anything, but over the next several weeks, we're going to study how Samson systematically broke all of those vows. Okay? All of those vows. But, but the question is here, why? Why does God want Samson to take this vow? And people have often misunderstood Samson's story. Have you ever heard Samson's story being told, well, there's magic power in his long hair? And as soon as you cut his his magic hair, it's like it's Rapunzel or something, right? And as soon as you cut his long hair, then he lost all of his power. Is that the story God is conveying here? No, you realize the cutting of his hair was the last prohibition of the vow that he broke, right? That was the last part that fell. But what God was doing for Samson was he was setting him apart from conception, from conception. Even as God was knitting Samson together in his mother's womb, God was showing this man was going to be holy. He was set apart. He's the Savior of Israel. That's what God is showing. Does God remain, does Samson remain holy and set apart? No. He broke all of his vows, right? And that did not surprise God either. He gives a hint of Samson's future to his mother. Do you notice that at the end of verse 5? Did you notice this little key word? The angel of the Lord said at the end, and he shall begin to save Israel. Do you see that? He shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistine. And this is the first hint we get from the text from God that Samson is not the true Savior. Right? That, that Samson is not the Savior that his people really needs. God hints that Samson's salvation will be an incomplete salvation. He's only going to start to give salvation to his people. He's only going to begin it from the Philistines, but he's not going to finish the job. Salvation, uh, Samson's salvation will start the saving process, but it's not going to finish it. In fact, we know that because if you keep reading the biblical story... Samuel and Saul and David all are dealing with the Philistines, right? With the Philistines. But this is a fitting description of Samson's work of saving because it's incomplete. It's incomplete. He can't provide true, perfect, and eternal salvation. He he just can't do it. He's a sinner, right? He's a sinner. And so the author is informing us that if we want a complete salvation, we need to look to a complete Savior. We need to look to a complete Savior. And and that's where we need to be looking to Jesus Christ, right? Who not only had a miraculous birth, but He had a righteous life to match it, right? Jesus, we're told, always did what was pleasing to the Father. He never sinned, right? We're going to see Samson empowered by the Holy Spirit but he cares more about his own pleasure and his own desires than about God's. And then Jesus comes and he lives a perfect life in complete submission to the Father's will. He always did what was pleasing to the Father. He never sinned, right? He always did what was right according to God's standard of righteousness, not man's standard. And he too was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And we also know that Samson... You know, the, I'm giving away a lot of his story this morning. Here, here it is. How does Samson end his life? Samson sacrifices his own life to kill his enemy. But we need a Savior who's going to sacrifice his own life to save his enemies. And that's what Jesus did. As he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Samson is just starting this work. But he's not the Savior we need, right? He's incomplete in this work. We need Jesus who's going to die for our sins, rise from the dead, and who now, right now, where's Jesus? He's at the Father's right hand doing what? Interceding for us. And so as I was thinking about how incomplete the salvation is that Samson offered compared to Jesus' salvation, my mind went to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. And Hebrews 7.25 is talking about how Jesus is our high priest right now. Listen to these words. The author writes, Consequently, Jesus, He is able to save to the uttermost 
those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Do, do you see that? Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. What does that mean? It means he's able to save forever. It means he's able to save completely. All those who draw near to God through him by faith, he's able to save completely forever. And how do we know that? How do we know he's able to save us completely? How do we know Jesus' salvation is only good for the first thousand sins? How do we know? What does the author say? The author says, because he always lives to intercede for us. And I know many tender-hearted believers who struggle with assurance for their salvation, and they struggle with God's love for them. And Hebrews 7.25 it's such a wonderful verse to memorize and to meditate upon because we're being told that Jesus saves us completely and eternally and he saves us forever. Not because we never fail him, not because we never struggle, not because we never doubt. No, the assurance is not grounded in us. The assurance is grounded where? In him. It's grounded in him because he saves us forever because he lives forever to intercede for us. Because not only did Jesus die for our sins, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. He lives eternally. And so he always lives. As, as long as Jesus is alive, he's able to intercede for you, brothers and sisters. If Jesus could not be alive anymore, then you're in trouble. But because he lives forever, you are eternally secure because he always lives to do that interceding work for us. We don't have an incomplete salvation because we don't have an incomplete Savior. In Jesus, we have an eternally secure salvation because we have, because we have a Savior who does not leave any aspect of our salvation up to us. Praise the Lord, right? If we were responsible to save ourselves, we'd all be lost. We'd all be condemned, but praise be to God for our salvation is not accomplished by us. It was accomplished by Jesus, and all we need to do is receive it by faith. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for any here who need to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and His present work of intercession for us. I pray that, Lord, Your Spirit would open our eyes to our great need. I pray, Lord, that Your Spirit would remind us of the great joy of salvation that Jesus has provided. And even as we see Samson's failures and shortcomings, Lord, may they remind us of how perfect Christ is for us and the hope and security we have only in Him. And Lord, may that assurance, that comfort, and that truth Encourage us to serve Christ in this life here and now today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.